Okay, so uh, for, yeah, for those who don't know me, my name is Russell Keith McGee. My day job is as the CTO and co-founder of Trades Cloud. Uh, we're a cloud provider of services, uh, software services for tradespeople, so plumbers, electricians, people like that. Uh, but that, like I said, is my day job. Uh, the reason that I'm here is that I've been a core developer on the Django project uh, since January of 2006. Uh, I've been president of the Django Software Foundation since 2010. Uh, the DSF, as I said in my introduction this morning, is the, the IP legal and fundraising arm of the Django project. So if you are interested, if you, are, if you represent a company that has money, I'd like to talk to you because uh, we, we need your money. Uh, but that's, why, that's not why I'm here today. Today I'm here to talk about class-based views. Um, class-based views were introduced in Django 1.3, uh, but have not been, how should I put this, uh, greeted with universal enthusiasm. Uh, so let's, uh, the reason I'm giving this talk, and this is, this is a, 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 a redo of a talk that I gave about a month ago at uh, DjangoCon Australia. Um, I want to clear up the mess. What, what are class-based views? Why do they exist? And why should anyone care? Um, now, I'd like to emphasize this isn't a tutorial. Um, it's an attempt to sort of set the big picture straight in the hope that by getting the big picture straight, I'll be able to set some of the broader discussions about class-based views that I keep seeing on mailing lists and Twitter and things like that, and try to set those discussions going in a slightly better direction, or at least stop from being quite so badly wrong that sort of the fundamentals that those discussions sometimes get based on. So if we're talking big picture, um, to explain why it is what we've got, what we've got, it helps to know where we've come from. You know, people who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. So. Cast your mind back to the halcyon days of 2005. Um, to Django was introduced as a, as a mechanism for building websites. Uh, views are there for displaying content. There are lots of common patterns in views, and we all like being dry. We like not repeating ourselves. So Django had this concept of, uh, of generic views. Um, they, they were added because we wanted those properties. They weren't in Django's very original release. They were added on July 25th, uh, 2005, release 304. So about two weeks after Django went public, class-based views, or first, sorry, uh, generic views uh, first landed in, in Django's code base. And they were added because we had these common problems we wanted to solve. We wanted to avoid uh, um, uh, re reproducing the same code over and over again. So you refactor all the code you have. You identify those key patterns. Generic views are there to do things like display a template, display a single object on a page, display a list of objects on a page, uh, display a form with you know, the create, update, and delete kind of consequences of displaying a form, display an archive of, of, uh, of objects based around date. Remember, Django is coming from a, a journalism or a strong journalism background, so uh, a list of articles by date is a common problem that people were trying to solve. Those generic views are then wrapped up in sort of a, in a, in a, in sort of a they have a couple of key features. Each view is a function, and you configure that function by passing in arguments to, to control how you want that function to operate. So, for example, a common, this is sort of a, a running through the code that you would have written for an edit view for a book. The, the book, the view, you take a request object and you pass in the ID number of the book you want to edit. Uh, you do a try catch to, or try accept to get the book. If the book doesn't exist, return a 404. Uh, if it's a post, then we're actually saving the result of the form. Okay, so we need to instantiate the form with the data from the request uh, and the instance of the book that we're just trying to edit. Check that the form is valid. Have we provided all the information that's required? If it is, then save that form and then redirect to the URL for that particular book. Fantastic. If it's not a, a post request, then we're going to assume that it's a get request. Uh, generate the form for just the empty instantiated, show us what the form should look like, and render the, um, that form and the object against some sort of template. Okay, so absolutely boring vanilla code, and if you would go and reproduce that code over and over and over again for every object type that you wanted to edit. You then take that view and you deploy it uh, into your URL patterns. Okay, define a, a URL pattern that says I want to edit a book slash book slash ID is where we're going to go. That view is the book view. We're going to call it edit book so we can do a, a URL, a name based URL lookup. Uh, and everything's all nice and happy. We've now got our view for editing a book into our project. But then generic views are there to say, okay, well, that code is so cookie cutter, it's so generic that we can replace that. Instead of talking about your generic, or so your base idea of an update object, 
we're going to replace, sorry, a book view, we're going to replace it with this idea of updating an object and configure it to say this update object, well, specifically, we're going to be updating books. So we're going to be looking for books based upon an object ID. The name of the URL is exactly the same. The operation of that function is exactly the same. So instead of having to rewrite the boilerplate to update an object and have that try, catch, if, post, blah, 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 you can just say, well, here is a pre-canned version, or all I need to drop in is the model, which is a book. Fantastic. Which means that, okay, we then we have books. We also want to be able to edit authors. The only thing we need to change is where the URL fits. It's slash author instead of slash book. Um, the model that we're configuring is author rather than book. And the name of the URL is edit author instead of edit book. Okay, so that's you know, the best, best practices of code reuse. Find the thing that you're doing over and over and over again. Factor it out into something generic and then configure it on each individual use. Fantastic. So... There are some problems, though. Okay, so configuration options, the configuration options for that generic function view uh, are limited by the arguments you can pass in. Okay, so it is a function at the end of the day, and we are passing in different arguments to make that thing happen. If you want to uh, instantiate a different form, instead of you know, a generic model form that's being, uh, being created, you want to have a very specific form be instantiated based upon some sort of property of the object that you've actually retrieved. Well, you can't do that. Do you want to perform some sort of logic after the form has been validated, but before the form is saved? Well, unless you can actually put that logic onto the form's save method itself, you don't have an entry point to inject that logic. Uh, do you want to pass in extra arguments to the form instantiation? Like, for example, really something really simple like the request. Well, no, unless you can put it into a decorator or something like that, I, 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 you, you, can't, you can't do it. Do you have common permissions logic that you want to run? Now, this view or parts of the, you can only access this object if you have a particular permission. Unless you can put that on a decorator, you can't do it. So how do we address these problems? Well, okay, you can keep adding new functional entry points, so you can keep saying, okay, well, here's another configuration, another configuration argument, another configuration argument. Or you can say, okay, well, that configuration argument can actually be a callable. And we can say, okay, well, you pass in the function that you want to operate in this particular part of the function and you know, get all completely you know, you know, meta and, and deep like that. Um, but at some point, what you basically end up doing is poorly implementing half of the features of class inheritance. So as an example of, of what sort of thing I'm talking about here in practice, let's go back to our edit book example view. You've written this code, everyone has written this code at some point, um, and it's really, really easy to say, well, okay, if the form is valid, before we save, do something. So, you know, we want to prepare the book before we actually save the form. Trivial to do if you've got access to the full view, almost impossible to do if you've got, well, you can't do it with the generic function-based views that were in Django as of uh, 1.3, almost impossible to do in a clean way or to extend those function-based views to make that use case really, really easily. So, again, we must refactor all the things. And instead of trying to pretend that we're going to implement class-based views by hacking them into a function, let's actually go class-based. Let's actually make these things classes. Subclassing gives you these entry points. You can say, I've got some behaviour here. My base behaviour is to do nothing or to do a very simple thing. But you can then subclass and add additional behaviour that you want. Uh, you can override specific pieces of logic. You can use class mix-ins to compose behaviour out, uh, out of a collection of objects. And that's essentially what we did for Django 1.3. Now, it turns out that, although that's you know, the high-level architectural goal, uh, in practice it turns out to be not quite that simple. There are lots of little details that needed to get sorted out. The discussion around class-based views went on for years. Uh, there were several draft attempts made at landing something that was a class-based view. Uh, Jacob Kaplan-Moss tried, Joseph Cochran's tried, Ben Fershman tried. Uh, I am sort of the person who stands on the shoulders of giants there. I'm responsible. I'm the person who did the final push and got building on top of the efforts of all of those, those gentlemen uh, and finally ended up committing something for 1.3. So the architecture that I committed is most like the work that Ben did. Ben built on top of what, uh, what uh, Joseph did. Joseph built on top of what, what Jacob did. Unfortunately, that's where the wheels fell off the whole process. Um, <laughs> why, why did that happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's a lot of confusion, or there, were a lot, there has been a lot of confusion about what class-based views actually are and what they 
should be or can be used for. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of that confusion is because there's two very distinct purposes in the code base around this sort of this one commit that was the feature that got landed in 1.3. Um, and those two very distinct purposes or two very distinct pieces of work were wrapped into a single commit and as a result sort of look like one feature. The second problem is that the implementation isn't necessarily obvious. Uh, it's, the, it's implemented, or the class-based views are implemented the way they are for a very specific reason, but that reason leads to non-obvious complexity, that if you come to the idea for the first time, you think, well, why is it being done this way? Isn't this other way? Wouldn't it have made a lot more sense and been a lot more obvious? There's a reason why it's not like that. The third uh, criticism that sort of has been levelled is uh, something that's labelled ravioli code. Uh, I'll come back to exactly what this means. It's a legitimate criticism that, a legitimate architectural criticism, um, and I'll, I'll come sort of a bit of an explanation about what that means in a minute. And sort of the, the worst problem of all was that the documentation at the time it landed in 1.3 was, uh, to use the technical term, bad. Um, <laughs> I take full blame for that one. I wrote the documentation uh, that, such that it was in 1.3 and I, it was not good documentation by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if anything else, it's, a, it's a, uh, an abject lesson in the person who writes the code shouldn't be the person who documents it because it was obvious to me, so why isn't it obvious to you guys? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, since, since I landed my original documentation, uh, Mark Tamlin, Danny Greenfeld, and a number of others have made some really big contributions, some really big improvements in that area. So um, that, that situation, at least, has got a little bit better. But the rest of them still exist. So let's, let's go through them and try to clean up this wonderful mess what I made. First off, purpose. Uh, there are two very distinct pieces of work inside what is the feature of class-based views in Django 1.3. There are class-based views and there are class-based generic views. When people talk about the commit, it usually gets spoken about in terms of these class-based views, but it is very two very distinct pieces of work. Class-based views are a class-based analogue of a view function. They, it has in, embedded in it, as part of the implementation, uh, method-based HTTP ver verb dispatch, and that's it. Okay, that is all a class-based view is. It's a way of saying, I've got a GET request, implement this piece of functionality, or perform this piece of logic. So, for example, we go back to our, this is, this is essentially a class-based view. Okay? It is a class, my class is my view, and it extends a base class called view. You have a GET method, guess what? If someone makes a GET request, that's the method that gets invoked. If someone makes, invokes a POST request, the POST request is what gets invoked. That is all class-based views are. But because it is wrapped around a base class, you get, get a whole bunch of interesting features for free. You could get automated options handling. So, okay, for those of you who are sort of aren't that familiar with HTTP or the internals of HTTP, the HTTP verb is sort of the request, you're, the, the name of the thing you're asking the web server to do. The ones that everyone knows about are get and post because it's kind of the read and the write versions of what you're doing on the internet. But there's actually a whole bunch of other useful verbs. Options is the way you ask, what verbs can I use? If I go to this URL, what can I do? Can I do a get? Can I do a post? Can I do a put? Can I do a delete? Can I do a trace? What options are available to me? And you get that, you get options handling for free when you use a class-based view because we know if you've defined a get method, therefore you support gets. You also get uh, automatic naive head request handling. Now a head request is essentially a way of asking the server, hypothetically, if I was to request this URL, how big would it be? Give me the headers, not the content, just the headers for how big this request would be which is then useful if you're doing sort of, you know, performance optimization stuff for a large file delivery or something like that. You can say, how big is this content? And then prepare yourself for how big that content is actually going to be. You can implement that in a function-based view, but in a class-based view, you can do a naive implementation. I just do the, you can just do the get request and then don't return the body content. Okay? And you can get that for free. You also automatically get HTTP 405 on any verb that isn't supported. So HTTP 405 is method not allowed. So if you have got a view that you specifically do not want to allow GET requests, just don't implement GET, and anyone who does a GET request on that URL will get HTTP 405. Okay? That is particularly useful when you look at a function-based view. Most people write a function-based view. If you don't have any other logic in there, essentially it doesn't matter whether you ask for a GET, PUT, POST, OPTIONS, HEAD, the function-based view will return the same content, which by, strictly by the HTTP standard is not what it's supposed to do. Okay, so 
by doing it, by, by having this class by structure, you can deal with the verbs properly so that you can say, no, you can't do that when someone does something that you're not supposed to be doing. Okay, so that's class-based views. Layered on top of class-based views are class-based generic views. These use the class-based view as, as a base and then create analogues of all of the old function-based generic views in, class, in a class-based form. Along the way, addressing the limitations of the functional-based approach so you can have the injection points, you can have the extension points available to you using basic you know, subclassing and mix-ins and all the nice things that you can do with object orientation without having to go into this, um, you know, trying to invent class-based views by passing in callables or passing in more, uh, uh, more keyword arguments to the configuration of the function. The catch is that by addressing the limitations of, that, of, the, of the approach, of the functional approach, is that you introduce a whole new body of knowledge. It's now you need to understand the class structure for how generic class-based or how generic views work in order to be able to do anything with them. That's the ravioli criticism, essentially, and I'll come, again, I'll come back to exactly why it's, uh, what, what that means and why, why the term ravioli gets used. The second criticism that gets levelled against class-based views is the implementation choice. The approach that we took is not the obvious one. There are a couple of deployment things you have to do. The way you put a class-based view into your URL patterns looks a little odd. It looks a little odd because it ha can't be done the obvious way. The, the, the obvious approach, just drop the class in the view, has some side effects and would require either an overhead on the part of developers or an overhead on, part, on the part of the framework that we weren't willing to live with. I won't go through the details of why we've done it the way we've done it. The good news is that Django's wiki actually has a complete teardown of the history of de the development of class-based views. If you go to that URL, what you will find is these are the 10 options we looked at. Here are the pros and cons of every one of them, and this is why we chose this one. Okay, so it's, here is the design decision behind why we've got what we've got. So if you're, if you're interested, it's certainly worth a read, and you can sort of find the, find the backstory for why you have to do as view. Okay, problem three, ravioli. Um, this phrase came into being because one of actually one of Django's core developers, a guy named Luke Plant. Um, it's describing the fact that the end product that we've got, or ravioli is sort of as a product, is delicious and tasty and looks lovely in a nice little square packet or triangular packet that's sitting in your plate. The internals, however, don't ask too many questions. They're kind of minced and unclear and may contain products you don't want to know about. It also means that there's a price to becoming an expert. Unless you know what the internals were made of, you can't just reproduce it. Okay? You end up, yes, with a very attractive outside package, but the inside, you need expert knowledge to know how to make the inside of the ravioli. Now, this is an entirely legitimate criticism. You know, the, the, uh, the, the generic class-based views have a very, very complex internal structure. There are lots of entry points. There are, there's, there's, there's all sorts of subclasses and mixings that, get, that come together to give you the final end product that is an update view. And unfortunately, in order to use them at all for anything other than the most trivial case, you need to understand all of it. And that means that the learning curve is hideously steep. That then gets compounded when you have really bad documentation um, that doesn't explain how to get to the expert position really, really quickly. So yeah, the minimum quantum of knowledge to, to actually operate is much larger than it should be. So here's my ravioli cooking class 101. Um, let's have a look at our sort of pseudocode version of our original view here. Here's an edit view. We need to get an object. If it's a post, get the form. If the form's valid, handle the form and redirect. Otherwise, we need to handle the failure in some way. If we go back and it was a get request, then we need to get the form and then we need to return a response. So how does this manifest in a generic class-based view? That's the collection of mix-ins that go together to make that view happen. So let's step through them one by one. In the in internals, right on the in inside, we've got a single object mix-in. We are dealing with a view that will be returning a single object, or it's dealing with a single object. We need to put that single object into a context so that we can actually deal with that single object. So we have a context mix-in, which is subclassed into a single object mix-in, which essentially all it does is say, I can make sure that I can render a single object on a page. 
Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, and that's basically doing the get object part of this picture. I'm dealing with a single object. I need to be able to get an object. Process form view is the bit that says, okay, well, this is a view that's dealing with forms. That means I need to be able to deal with get, posts, and puts. So let's make sure that I've got a get, post, and put entry point, and that that then defers to whatever it is the rest of this form of this, this page is doing. If it's dealing with a single object, lots of objects, I don't know, but I need to be able to do get, post, and put, and we'll defer everything else to subclasses. What exactly are we going to do? Well, okay, in this case, we're dealing with a form. The form needs to be handled, and the way we deal with forms, we need to instantiate a form, and then we need to check the form is valid, and we need to uh, handle the failure, and we need to be able to instantiate the form when we have data, when we don't have data. But in particular, this is a form that's been driven by a model, so we need to be able to generate a model-based form. So we have a form mix-in, which contributes to the model form mix-in. The model form mix-in knows that it's dealing with a single object, so it is also bringing in the single object mix-in to give you a model form dealing with a single object. And then, at the end of the day, having handled the, got the object, handled the form, dealt with it appropriately, we need to give a response back to someone, we have a single object template response mix-in, which says, given that I know I've got a single object in my context and it's been handled in an appropriate way, render it, render that single object into a template. Okay, and again, the single object template response mix-in is an extension of template response mix-in, which is the generic, I need to return a template. The single object template response mix-in is, I need to return a template. That deals with a single object. So, there we go. Simple. Nine classes to go and get you, nine, nine mix-ins to get you a simple view that allows you to do updating a single object with a form. What's the problem? I, 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 mm. Okay, so, but there's, this, is, this is why it's so complicated. Let's say we want to move from being an edit view to being a create view. What's the difference in the processing? Well, fundamentally, it's exactly the same, except that instead of creating or getting an existing object, we need to be able to instantiate a dummy object and then make sure that dummy object gets saved. Well, here is the new object we want to create. So all we really want to modify is the bit right at the beginning. The get object needs to turn into instantiate an object. So all we need to do is change the base update view to a base create view that knows how to create objects rather than getting an existing one. Okay? So the, most of the code is exactly the same. We just have to use one slightly different base class which knows how to instantiate rather than, than retrieving from a database. Well, okay, what about instead of uh, creating, we've got this create view, instead of responding as a template, we want to respond uh, with JSON content. We want to build an API. Well, okay. The creation process, we're still going to be dealing with a form, we're still going to be dealing with instantiating an object. All that stuff is the same. The only thing that's different is down the bottom, instead of rendering to a template, we want to render to a JSON response. So you can switch out the single template, uh, single object template response mix in with a single object JSON response mix in, and all of a sudden it starts generating JSON content. And everything else can get reused. What does it look like when it actually gets deployed? Okay, well, this is your generic function-based view. You're asking for update object. You pass in the class we want to configure. It's the book, uh, and we give it a URL. Effectively, this is all you're doing. You're saying, instead of uh, passing in the function update view, you get the class update view, and you say, I want to use this as a view for the book model. Okay, and this is the bit I was talking about. The, the, that is not necessarily the obvious way to use a class. There's a reason it needs to be done this way, though. So um, dig into the, the, that wiki page I gave you if you, want to, um, if you want to see the reason why. That is doing it in one line. If you do, however, want to uh, you know, bring it out as a class in your own, that's essentially just shorthand for saying, I've got this class called a book update view. It extends generic update view, and it's configured to use a particular model as a book. And then you just say book update view dot as view, and there you go. You can deploy that you know multiple times in your URL structure if you wanted to. Okay, so but other than using up more lines of code, um, why would you want to pull this out as a separate class? Well, the reason is that then you can extend it yourself. So subclassing lets you dig into the internals and overwrite your own pieces of behaviour if you want to. So remember back when we said uh, you couldn't inject logic into the process to say you know if this form is successful. Um, but before we save it, we want to do some extra processing. Well, okay, all you've got to do is say, here's form valid. By default, form valid will save the form. But we want to do some processing first, self.object.process, and then just do whatever the base class wanted us to do. Go off and save the form. Okay? So you can easily inject logic in, and all you need to do is overwrite a single method 
you need to know that that's the method you need to, need to override, but you override one method, inject the logic into the flow where you want, and off you go. Okay, well, what about something more complex? Um, let's have a look at something like permissions. Okay, uh, you can use mix-ins to define behaviour and then inject that behaviour into any class you want. So let's say we've got a really, really complex permission scheme here uh, based upon random number generation. Um, you want any attempt to access a single object to be checked against a dice roll, and if you pass the dice roll, then you're allowed to see the object. Fantastic. All you've got to do is override the way that you get that single object. By default, the implementation of get object will go and get an object based upon the arguments that have been passed into the view. Override it, put some extra logic in there to say if the random number exceeds whatever threshold, uh, then you're allowed to see it. Otherwise, return a 404, no you're not. Or any other 404 if you want to do it, you know, any, any other HTTP response if you want. And then all you've got to do is say, okay, well there's my mix in, it defines get object. You can drop that into any view, update view, create view, whatever. You've got a reusable block of random based permissions logic uh, to, to inject into any view that you want to do, you want to handle that with. Uh, now, as a side note, the form valid method that I had on the previous slide, you could have done that as a mix-in as well. Um, it's just a question of how reusable a piece of logic is in practice. A specific post-save behaviour probably doesn't have a lot of reuse potential, so an override in a subclass makes a little bit of sense. Permission checking is something that's likely, you're likely to have the same permission scheme uh, in existence for all objects, so pull that into a mix-in, reuse that mix-in over and over again. So, at the end of the day, remember, ravioli tastes good. There's a, there's a reason the Italians keep making it. Um, ravioli allows, ravioli code in this context, let, allows us to reuse core logic over and over again. You only need to define once, how do I get a single object? And then you can reuse that logic everywhere you've got a view that deals with a single object. It's extremely flexible for inserting new logic. It's easy to add your own mix-ins. But, unfortunately, you need to grok all the pieces to be able to know where you've got to go. So, like I said, the technical term for the documentation state at time of delivery was bad. Um, it got all the details 100% correct, but completely missed the big picture. Uh, it's kind of like the, the joke about the, uh, the person sailing by in a, uh, in a hot air balloon, goes past the, uh, the, the tall building, yells out, say, excuse me, can you, so can you tell me where, where am I? And the guy says, you're in a hot air balloon, 100 metres off the ground. Technically, 100% correct. Utterly useless information. <laughs> so, yeah, the documentation mixed the big, missed the big picture. You still also need to make some framework decisions. Uh, we have kind of not made at a project level a decision about whether we should be using class decorators. Uh, so take something like a login required decorator, a login required mechanism. Easy to do in a class, but on, on a, on a function-based view, you just wrap it with a decorator that says login required. Do you use a mix-in? Do you use a class decorator? Do you use a method decorator on the class? There are, there are multiple ways to skin that cat. And as a result, there's now kind of multiple ways to do it and no officially blessed right way for as far as Django the project and our documentation is concerned. So at one level, as a core team, we kind of need to bite the bullet, pick one, and then encourage everyone to kind of run with it. Okay, so... Where do we go from here? Um, documentation can always improve. Uh, there are some high-level decisions that we probably need to make and then in integrate that into documentation. Um, we can extend what is currently there. Like I said, when we, when we landed, um, when we landed one point, in 1.3, the generic class-based views, we very deliberately drew the line at replace what is there. Now, we had a create view, we had an update view, we had, a, a, um, we had that sort of basic set. Let's just replace what's there. We know there are infinite panoply of things we could build, let's sit to this, deliver that, and then we'll move on from there. Now that leaves lots of new territory. There are lots of additional class-based generic views that could be built. You know, there, there wasn't a function-based generic view for handling form sets, so there isn't a class-based generic view for handling form sets either. It's an obvious addition. Or object plus inline form set. Um, this, that sort of thing, it isn't an obvious um, it's an obvious construct to have because we do it in admin. So there is room to expand and add those generic class-based views into, into Django and officially bless them. So why haven't we added them in the intervening years? Well, first off, I need to ask the question, have we solved the wrong problem here? Um, if we go back 30-odd slides, 
uh, I put up this list of uh, features of generic views, and we need to be able to display a template. We need to be able to display a list, a single object, a list of objects, a form. We need to be able to create, update, delete objects. We need to be able to display a date archive. Um, these were all very, very common problems in 2005. You know, we were coming from a world where we had great big Java-based websites that we all wanted to kill ourselves because we had to deal with them. And we've replaced it with this lightweight, fresh framework. Let's just build these functions really, really easily because we were solving the problems we had in 2005. Modern websites have different problems, or at least much more involved answers to the same problems. A, you know, a, a genuine, hey, look, this is, a, this is a schmick modern website, has multiple forms and form sets per page. It has continuous scrolling rather than pagination-based uh, uh, views of the world. It will almost inevitably be dealing with Ajax at some level, including things like in-place editing and in, uh, on, on, on-page live form validation of content. Um, you've got to have things like PJAX for navigation, so like the GitHub thing where you, the page header is always there and you navigate and the URL changes, but you're only really reloading part of the page's content. Uh, you'll have the concept of having multiple actions per page. You don't go to the create page to create. You'll go to a page and you'll have a whole bunch of different actions you can do that you want to be able to interact with each one of them. And then you've got you know, rich JavaScript-driven driven user interfaces where you've got, you know, the, the, yes, there is back-end data that's being provided to you, but what you've got on the front end is, is a rich API-driven user interface. The, emer and so the emergence of things like React and Angular and Ember are kind of a... a this is what the tools we're using to build these front end, front end tools. And, and Django has kind of historically said, no, we're just server side. Um, we don't deal with the front end. But as a result, we kind of haven't adapted well to these problems that exist and interacting with, these, with the front end problems. So in particular, the API driven user interface is something that I, I kind of want to harp on. As an audience, um, I think we can take it as a given that good websites, you know, good, good software products that we're delivering these days have APIs. They're documented, they're versioned, full first-class citizens of the ecosystem we're trying to, trying to develop. And like I said, by, by delivering this as sort of part of the website experience, you actually genuinely build an ecosystem. It enables other people to remix and reuse the functionality of this website in ways that you as the person who just delivered a user interface uh, possibly haven't envisaged or, 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 or conceived of. And if you think about it, is there any reason that an appropriately authenticated automated process shouldn't be able to do everything that an appropriately authenticated actual human can do? Um, the easiest way to make this happen is to make the user interface and the API have functional parity. And at the end point, really, a user interface is just a way to allow Meet to invoke an API and then visualise the response of that in a way that Meet can understand. So why not make the API that the centre of what we're working on here? Completely aside from the sort of force multiplier benefits, there's a simple engineering benefit because APIs are easily tested. And if the user interface is just invoking an API, then you've got a good conceptual separation between what it is we're actually trying to achieve that we can then test, ser test seriously. And we've got a user interface that needs to invoke that, user, uh, that API, which we can test against. You've got good separation there between the presentation and between the, uh, the actual um, uh, yeah, the, the, the functionality you're trying to drive. It gives you a testing boundary. API-driven user interfaces are you know, really easy to generate in, in Django. We've got APIs that are easy to generate. We've got Django REST framework. We've got TastyPy and others that are out there. But what we're missing are the views, the, the building the user interfaces. We still need to be able to describe navigation and composition of various pieces of functionality on a page. And all of this, I would argue, requires that we have a strong base framework to work with. And my argument is that class-based views provide that framework. Uh, not class-based generic views. I, I, I'm very strong at pointing, pointing that out. The class-based generic views are a great solution to the problem we had in 2005. I don't think the generic views we've got today are a great solution for today's problems. But that doesn't mean that class-based views can't be the basis for what we do. Why do I say that with confidence? Well, to a certain level, it's already being done. DjangoContrib.admin is a class-based view. It doesn't eat Django's own dog food, but it is class-based in that sense. You've got this object, a, an admin object, that you deploy into a URL structure that then knows how to do other more interesting things. Interestingly, it's implemented using a single call method, which is one of the approaches that the uh, 
class-based views that we've delivered as part of 1.3 rejected because there is actually some security implica implications in there. Um, again, dig into the documentation if you want to find about that or come and ask me and I can, um, I can sort of delve a little bit into the details for that. Um, so we, we got a proof that we can build a class-based complex user interface use class-based mechanisms to allow people to have extension points to add functionality to a complex user interface. Um, and I think this is something that's worth exploring a little bit more. Django, this, this however, doesn't need necessarily to be part of Django's core. Django's admin um, was distributed as part of core, but that's kind of a conceit of the packaging infrastructure that existed in 2005, um, which is to say that there wasn't packaging infrastructure in 2005. These days, pip install Django foo works, and everyone knows it works, and everyone just has their requirements file and deploys websites that relies on it. We could conceptually pull Django admin out into a completely separate package and then just have it automatically be installed when you install Django. It's, it's easy to do that kind of thing now with the state of setup tools being where it is. So if we're going to genuinely replace admin or use admin as a testing ground for what we can do long term in terms of class-based structures, um, we can do this completely outside of core, maybe with a long-term image of bringing in as a core managed project or something, but exploring this idea of can we build rich user interfaces at a code level, class-based, with easy extension points and what have you, to support all of this API over here, user interface control over here, connected over, over the API layer. This is something we can test bed outside of Django, outside of core, and then possibly bring in interesting parts of it into core as a long-term thing. So, okay, there's sort of a call to action here. If you are out in the field and you are discussing class-based views and class-based generic views, please be clear about which of those you are actually referring to. If you're criticising class-based views, are you criticising class-based views or are you criticising class-based generic views? I will heartily endorse anyone criticising class-based generic views. They have, um, they have a multitude of problems. Criticising class-based views, however, you'll have a lot more struggle getting that argument across with me because I think there are much, much stronger framework that people give it credit for. Documentation can still be improved. So if you are interested in those class-based generic views or in just in class-based views for that matter, there is a lot of work we could do to improve that documentation and we've got sprints coming up this weekend so if you feel like contributing that would certainly be a helpful way to contribute. If you are interested in extending what is there, there are tickets, things like uh, 18830 is a, is a ticket that I logged a while back about an idea called form collection, ways of getting richer functionality into class-based generic views without necessarily adding a whole new farm of, uh, of class-based generic view mix-ins and what have you. Um, but also experiment, experiment with APIs. This sort of broad idea of building rich user interfaces at a functional level to say ad Django's admin is really just a deeply introspective, but it's really just a user interface to say, here's a list of things we can get at, and here is a way of displaying an object and having multiple pieces of functionality with filtering and uh, you know, in-place editing and in-place in uh, form submission. This is an idea we can play around with. I'm not saying I have any solutions. I'm certainly interested in talking about it if anybody wants to talk about it. Um, I'm interested to talk about many things at great length. Um, so... Uh, play around. We, know we don't have to, to live with, just because of the tools we've got are the tools we've got, Django needs to continue to evolve or we run the risk of being uh, taken over by projects like Meteor and Node.js and please, I don't want to write JavaScript for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but the only way we're going to be able to compete with Meteor's demo of, hey, look, a live chat server in, 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 20, in 10 minutes is to have a compelling counterexample that we can build things much more complex than that in 10 minutes. So from that, if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and hopefully I've seeded some ideas into the community and, and said a few things straight about the state of class-based views. So. <laughs>